Hello, everybody. It's Mary Rowe from the Canadian Urban Institute. Welcome back to City Talk. It is September 2020. We took a bit of a hiatus there in August. I hope that people got a chance to take a bit of a break. We did, uh, trying to just regroup and uh, get, get, catch our breath, but also uh, watch really carefully to see what's happening around us as uh, we continue to adapt and adjust to uh, the realities of this global pandemic. And um, today is the 30th anniversary of the Canadian Urban Institute. Who knew? Uh, it was created in 1990, if you can do the math, and uh, an organization set up to uh, foster healthy urban development. It's been doing all sorts of interesting things since, and uh, I have the privilege of being its CEO, uh, actually for the last year, almost to the day. My first uh, day was a year ago now. So, uh, and who knew that we'd be embarking on this extraordinary experiment where we reinvent urbanism, or it's reinvented for us before our eyes, and then we figure out what our, the implications are. So we're really, really fortunate to have someone like Dan Hill, who's agreed to help chart a bit of a course, be a provocateur for us um, in our first annual leadership lecture, which we hope will be, as we suggest, annual every year at this time, we anticipate. And he's got a tough task here because he's not just speaking about any old time in urban life, he's actually talking about this time in urban life. And uh, before I give you any more details on Dan, you can look him up. Uh, if you've signed up for this, you'll will, you will be aware of his bio. Uh, you'll know that he's an esteemed person who's worked in a bunch of different jurisdictions in the UK and now in the EU. Uh, and he takes a, a very uh, particular approach as a designer uh, and as a person who thinks and sees systems and interactions and and how things fit together. So Dan, before I pass to you, I just want to thank you. Even before you open your mouth, we're going to thank you. Um, I also just want to, I, I want to apologize to all the Canadians uh, who are watching. And, and one of the nice things about City Talk is uh, people check in wherever they're, um, uh, wherever they're watching from. So if people want to do that now, the chat kind of blows up, but we get to see where they're coming from. And so if you wanted to sign in and tell us where you're listening from, that would be great. But I just want to apologize to all the Canadians on your behalf, Dan, because um, uh, many Canadians associate your name, Dan Hill, with a song uh, which is now going to be an earworm in everyone's head in the 70s, a very popular song that, shall we say, had a rather sentimental lyric and, her and melody. And, uh, and I know I'm going to get emails from people saying, thanks, Mary, I have to have that song in my head now. So hopefully your lecture is going to be substantively so compelling that they will force that song from their memory. You know, as I get older, I'm looking more and more like him as well. So it's kind of, it's... <laughs> It's, usually this isn't a problem, but giving a talk in Canada, of course, it's, I now so, realize it's a so problem. You, you have heard the, you have heard the association with this song sometimes when of we Of course, talk. number, I think it was number five in the UK in 1975. I see, will you even know the date on it? I hadn't appreciated it. Well, I would, because I have the same name as the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I see, but you didn't get the royalties, let's just say. So, no, I'll, uh, never be, uh, I'll never be the number one Dan Hill on Google either. So well, and Dan, and, and for all we know, Dan Hill, uh, and, and his, uh, he may be viewing for all we know, and his family and his father particularly, they have been very, very active in activism and community building in Canada for, for obviously for a couple of generations. So we appreciate the leadership of the Hill family, both musically and today we have them, uh, you uh, carrying the torch for Urn. Um, CUI, the Canadian Urban Institute, is a national organization, as many of you know, uh, I hope you know, and uh, Toronto, where this broadcast is uh, originating from and where I happen to be located, is the traditional territory of many First Nations, specifically the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. It's now home to many, many diverse nations, uh, first from the Métis and Métis people and Inuit. And we at CUI are continuing to come to terms with the legacies of exclusion that urbanism has perpetuated in terms of how it has uh, dis continues to discriminate against uh, First Nations and uh, people of color. And uh, we have, as many of you know, had a ser series of uh, sessions on City Talk that focused on anti-Black racism. So we're continuing to uh, navigate this and figure out how we emerge in, a, in a making cities more just, more equitable, more resilient. Um, as I suggested, I'm just going to remind people what CUI is as we head into this uh, interesting period of time, uh, the next couple of months. I always feel September is the new year, although I realize it technically isn't. And um, I'm just gonna remind people that we have been engaged in a number of things that we've put up since um, COVID began. One is this site, which I have to get to refresh, uh, called City Watch, which is um, a, a way to, for volunteers across the country who are uh, tracking for us what municipal governments are doing what particular policies they're implementing. Initially, the ones that we put in were ones that they were enacting. Now, increasingly, we're 
updating us and showing the ones that people are removing. So this is part of what I think we have to train ourselves to do is be really keen observers to see how are we responding in the urban context in Canada. And this is the municipal government page. We also at the same time put up something called City Share. And that is um, all these examples of community-based innovation of which there are I think 686 as you can see. Uh, that's at City Share Canada and again powered by volunteers, people posting things that they think are innovative and illustrative of a different kind of way that we can be approaching um, communities and strengthening communities. And, and out of this work came a really strong awareness on our part that we needed to start looking at what we were doing with main streets. Uh, and so hopefully I can show you that one too. Um, I have to get the mute bar off. I'm not quite sure how I do that. Here we go. Hmm, it's not letting me. Best laid plans, folks. I uh, can't show it to you. So, um, uh, but it's called Bring Back Main Street. Maybe it'll let me sneak it in. There, it did. Uh, Bring Back Main Street. And that is a huge campaign, which I think Dan's going to touch on because he had, has done some work on the high street in Britain. And uh, uh, many of us know, anecdotally, I just finished this morning my morning walk down my main street. A lot of things happening in main streets are obviously where commercial activity takes place, but it's also gathering places, places where people navigate with other people that aren't like them, all sorts of social services, public services, parks, animation, when, when all the uh, tension around equity has broken out over the last several months in cities around the world, where have people taken their uh, frustration to the streets? So we think it's very important that we be bringing back our main streets and we bring them back in new ways, in different ways to support whatever urbanism is gonna look like post COVID or through COVID even. Um, and then the last thing in terms of City Talk, the platform that we're on now, as many of you may know, uh, we've done about 60 of these and uh, we post them all. So that's a, a word of warning to everybody coming on. If this is your first City Talk, just remind, remind you, these are taped. They are then posted with a little summary and we post the chat. So we encourage you to contribute in the chat function, but just uh, just know that whatever you put up there stays up there and people will read it. Uh, and we've had thousands of people come and download these sessions. People are using them in classes now. I think it's a really uh, important kind of moment in time and archive of as we've been evolving and trying to make sense of COVID, um, all these City Talk sessions and they're all there. Uh, and Dan's session today, uh, he'll be joined by Cynthia Dorrington and Zara Ibrahim. Afterwards, that session will be posted like this one and you'll be able to download it, send it to your friends, uh, watch it in the middle of the night, whatever your preference is. Um, the last thing that I want to point out to people is something that we are continuing to track. We started something called COVID-100 and at 100 days in June, we marked the 100 day moment, came out with a report, a signpost report, uh, trying to highlight what we think the sort of key risk factors were in, in that first 100 days. We're heading into the second 100 days, the end of September, and we'll be back on City Talk talking about what the findings of that second checkpoint are. But part of our COVID-100 uh, website, this is COVID100.ca, as you can see, is we asked previous City Talk participants, of which there had been about 100, and to give us uh, one action that they thought we should be prioritizing. And if you need a moment of respite, if you need a moment of trying to take yourself a bit out of your own situation and think a bit more broadly, um, I encourage you to scan this. It's a remarkable repository of every kind of person, as you can see. Our, we've got lots of chains of office there, um, uh, mayors and uh, different kinds of activists and artists and designers and uh, philanthropists and community art organizers and city councilors and private business people. And there's many, 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 many of these people here. And uh, I would encourage you, former federal politicians, there's a few, uh, I would encourage you to spend some time with this. I think, I think, again, we need to take stock and understand what we're coming through and what the implications are. And these uh, sites that we've built, City Talk, City Share, City Watch, Bring Back Main Street, and this 100 Actions piece off the COVID-100 site, um, I think are really uh, effective framers. And so I just want to remind people that CUI does a lot of things. Uh, we are completely dependent on uh, partners like you and volunteers and people with resources who contribute financially uh, to make this happen. So um, very, very pleased to start our fall season with you, Dan. A uh, couple of things. If, if you want to volunteer for CUI, uh, we always need volunteers. And so you can always do that, COVID response at CUI.org. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And if you have suggestions on how we continue to structure city talk, topics, sponsors, all that kind of stuff, love to hear from you. Uh, just so you know, later in the month, we'll be coming back on housing because it's becoming more and more critical here. Uh, and we're going to come in on COVID 200 uh, and lots and lots of issues that we'll be focusing on. So, Dan, 
you're kind of a man who needs no introduction. I kind of counterintroduced you by saying who you weren't. You're not that Dan Hill, but you are now in Sweden. You are leading the innovation charge there. You're a longtime urbanist and uh, enthusiast for urban environments and really, uh, you know, a quality that Jane Jacobs identified, which we appreciate, which is that cities are as much about observation as they are about they're certainly more about observation than they are about prognostication or speculation. And so you're a great, great keen observer and we're very pleased to have you. So uh, I, I'm gonna give you a warm virtual welcome to deliver Thank the you. first annual leadership lecture on cities, Dan Hill. Thank you very much. I'm gonna just share my screen and hope that you can see that. Just let me know you can see that first slide, if that's all right. Yep, perfect. Y yep, cool, okay, thank you. And thanks so much, Mary. Um, I've never been introduced as the other Dan Hill before, um, so that's that's a new one for me. Um, I'm probably the only person usually in the audience that I speak to that knows who the other Dan Hill is, but of course, now you've pointed out to him, I'm going to be thinking of no nothing else. So anyway, this Dan Hill um, is coming to, to you from Stockholm, actually in my basement, which is why I have a picture of a bit of Swedish forest around the corner behind me. Um, and uh, I work for Vinova, as Mary said. Vinova is the Swedish government's innovation agency. So we're responsible for innovation across the country, sort of making sure that innovation is fit for purpose in Sweden. Um, I'll talk a bit about the work there, but I'll also talk about the fact that I've been around a bit, as we say. So I lived and worked in Italy, Australia, Finland, um, the UK, which is where I'm from originally, and done projects all over the place. Um, I always forget my affiliations and they always annoy, uh, get in touch when I do that. So I'm a visiting professor at UCL in London and uh, Design Academy Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And um, just to quickly get my background out of the way. So I'm a designer by background, um, as you'll probably tell from the way that I talk. Um, and I've worked on things like you know the, the Google campus in the top left corner where my team led the wayfinding strategy, working with lots of people there. The new VA building, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, this is when I was at Arup, the big design and engineering architecture firm. Barangaroo in Sydney in the top right there, but then also things like the City of Sheffield participation strategy. I'll talk a bit about that in the bottom left. State Library of Queensland in Australia, in Brisbane, um, which is where I started encountering uh, indigenous culture for the first time, which is you know really interesting to hear you talk about that. So well, Mary, in your introduction. And I've also, my background originally, though, is an interaction designer or service designer. So that means the design of small things, really, <laughs> or large things, if you think about websites and the internet as large things. But the way we interact with services, with digital things, with products, with communities. Um, so my work's become about cities over time, but originally it was at the scale of, this is a cell phone I worked on actually a couple of years ago by the Swiss company Punct, which is... Uh, Put it this way, a not smartphone, it's just a phone. It just has calls and texts and it has no data on it. So it's um, it's actually about foregrounding the environment around you. Uh, I don't know what Jane Jacobs would have made of that, but it's, um, it was an interesting thing to work on. So that's my background. And where I'm coming to you from, just for a bit of context, is this bit of Stockholm. In Hueda, it's called. It was um, designed, that's what it looks like now, but it actually hasn't changed much probably since it was laid out in about 1905, 1917. That's one of Sweden's first garden city plans. Um, like many plans from that time, it was, uh, it was built on fields to expand the city as the slums were getting overcrowded in the middle of Stockholm. And Stockholm was quite a poor place at that point. Uh, it's just worth saying at the turn of the 20th century or the 19th into the 20th century. So this garden city model was imported largely, as you probably all know, from the UK and Germany, people like Ebenezer Howard, and deployed here. And, I, and it's actually pretty good, as they often were, um, rolling around the landscape, uh, sort of light to medium density, lots of green space folded into it, lots of urban agriculture, basically walkable, active streets, tram lines of the city centre. I mean, it's pretty much what you do now, given a free hand, frankly maybe a touch more density, but actually it's pretty good. Schools and amenities, things like that there. But then what happened was uh, this, and this is about 1935, this film. And uh, don't worry if you can't hear it. Um, but this was effectively like a propaganda film on behalf of the car, made by, well, this is a Swedish newsreel actually. And you see this is Stockholm at the time, and you see those kids playing in the streets. And this film's sort of saying, okay, 
those days are over. It's now about the car. This guy is my personal hero. In the film, they refer to him as Mr. Stockholm. And he's just sort of single-handedly holding back the traffic, trying to almost hold back the the tide of the automobile industry is almost by himself. I mean, he's a considerable guy. Um, so this yeah, film, it was made all over the world. Obviously, people make these films in Canada and the US. Um, it's almost hard to watch because there's so many near misses in it. I hope the video is playing for you, I think. Uh, here he goes again. So it's kind of really making the case that, again, the street now is for the car, um, uh, kind of the technology of the time, I'd argue the big tech of the time, and people just need to get out of the way. So what happened to Enjueda, where I am, is that this road came through in about 1958, um, called Nunes Vegan. And you can kind of see, if you look at that, you can see where the roads were originally cutting across it. I could, if I just illustrate, you can see the sort of natural design lines carving through my house is over to the right a little bit. Uh, um, where we rent currently. And um, this just slices right through it. And again, no surprise to people in Canadian cities because this was happening there as well. Um, so, but this is where you get now. So, you know, what one of those white arrows I sketched was sort of supposed to go across to the right left there. Now there's this road. It's about 85 decibels near that road. Um, kind of wrecks the place. Anyway, so. <laughs> This, uh, in that Sweden by 1955 was Europe's most car dense land. Just in case you think uh, that Sweden is some kind of utopia, sometimes people from outside Sweden have that perception. Of course, there's pretty amazing things about it, but um, there's also the kind of issues that we have elsewhere. And my starting point for that is really looking at technology like the car in that case. And I borrow this quote from my compatriot, Cedric Price. He said in 1966, technology is the answer, but what was the question? And of course, the tech at the time, around the time when that road was being put in, was was the car. And he was really sort of asking, OK, well, there's the car. But, you know, what does Toronto or Ottawa or Montreal actually want to be? Like, what is the city about? How should we move around it? And then we can have a conversation about the technology. But of course, that didn't happen. Humans are very quick to jump on technical solutions, as you know. And, and I think what our role is as urbanists or designers or planners or activists or politicians or whatever you are, is to step back and ask the question carefully first. What kind of city is this? What is this city about? Again, then the tech is the easy bit. So it really means swapping out the outcomes and the enablers really carefully. And just to put it, I'll put it this way. You know, we don't make cities to make buildings. <laughs> buildings are an enabler of the things we make cities for. They're absolutely necessary, particularly in occasionally snowy countries like Canada and Sweden. But cities are about culture and community and commerce and conviviality and, you know, things beginning with C like that. Uh, those are the outcomes we're shooting for. And then, of course, you use tech and buildings and infrastructure to enable those things. But it's amazing how frequently we get that the wrong way around, particularly in a culture when, let's say, a property developer is holding quite a lot of the cards. And it sort of is their job to make cities out of buildings or rather make buildings in that way. So I kind of understand the issues there, but I'm just saying from a wider urban point of view, we need to ask, the, again, the conversation needs to be about what's the city about, then we can have a conversation about the buildings. And so uh, just in case you think I'm sort of anti-tech in some way, I'm actually a sort of a technologist deep down. My first degree was in computer science. So I'm kind of interested in it and uh, fascinated by it. And there are interesting things about it. So it just depends what we do. In the top left there, that's an autonomous shuttle, self-driving bus, basically designed in, in Finland, which is interesting. So it's made for minus 25 degrees C um, centigrade. Uh, it's like the interior, weirdly, is by Muji. They actually do have interior designers in Finland, obviously, but for some reason they threw that to Japan. But it sort of fits the surroundings, and that's really important. You know, it's not everywhere in the world is like, Can like California, as you know. Um, and there's an association with self-driving vehicles in California, but there's many more self-driving vehicles being built outside of California, often better tuned to their environment. The, the key question maybe is then who owns this thing and runs it? Is this part of public transport? Is this private? Is this Uber? Is this community owned? It could be community owned. You know, they, the, one of the more expensive parts of running a bus is the bus driver. And uh, if you assume these things can run without a bus driver, question mark, maybe you want a conductor or a local guide, but anyway. Um, if they did, then they could run in places where currently it's in theory and uneconomic to do so, like in rural environments or lower density environments or off peak in the middle of the night and so on, which is actually really interesting. But it depends on how you do it. If it's Uber running it, with all the respects to Uber, it won't run in those off peak times. 
or rather it'll be horribly expensive if it is. So there's a real equity question, even about that simple tech. The one in the middle is uh, renewable energy. Um, obviously, it's a microgrid based system. It's actually in Australia, in Perth. It's got solar cells in the roof, battery storage in the basement. Um, so St. Mary lives next door to me in an apartment there, and I like Mary, so that, that's cool. We can share the energy that's being generated on our roofs and stored in the basement. But say Mary wants to watch the Champions League football tonight, which is what I imagine she's going to do. And she needs a few extra kilowatts, then I'll throw her the kilowatts. Fine, she's a nice person. <laughs> she's my friend, so fine. But say we fell out for some reason. Say she made me a bad linguine last week or something. Do I give her the kilowatts at that point? We never had to think about that before. We've never made energy quite so social in that way. It's just electrons in the wall and we just turn it on usually. But now it's coming from the roof and it's part of our fabric. It's basically part of our shared space. That means we need to approach that as much as a sociologist, a psychologist, a community liaison worker, an interaction designer, as an engineer. So it's really, really important that we get this tech right in that way. I won't go through the rest of the things that I've been kind of things at hand. Um, so when tech leads that, as some of you will know from your Toronto experience of recent years, uh, it's a bit like the property developer leading it in a way, with, again, with all due respect to property developers, we are a Catholic and diverse group. Um, so that means to cast everybody in the same aspersion, but property developers make buildings, tech companies make tech. It's not necessarily about the city. And we can see that with things like Uber and Lyft and so on, where they've increased congestion in cities that already had congestion problems. It's much less 40% in somewhere like San Francisco. Or increased Airbnbs, increased rents in cities like Barcelona, which already had an affordability problem, and then Airbnb pushes it higher. So unless we handle this carefully, all of this tech is not so smart after all. And there's an issue there from a design point of view, because often... Uber, for instance, if I look at it as an interaction designer, so it's an exemplary piece of work. It works really well as an app. Clearly, it works incredibly well for individuals. Sort of works well as a service, although it's clearly bankrolled hugely by venture capital. But what does it do to the city? Well, 40% increase in congestion. So that right-hand side is largely unconsidered often in, uh, in the world of urban tech, and that's super problematic. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, this is Oslo Bicycle, which is run by Urban Sharing, which is an Oslo-based startup in Norway. This is a completely typical day in Norway, just so you know, it's always sunny um, in Oslo, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, and it's a beautiful product. It's really well made from an industrial design interaction design point of view. But perhaps more interestingly is sort of what its impact in terms of the wider civic relationship. Calling it Oslo Bicycle immediately makes this connection that it's the city's bikes. It belongs to Oslo itself. The, you are as a citizen in the city, therefore own the bikes. They're your bikes. You're part of Oslo and so on. In London, the bike sharing scheme is called Santander Cycles. And Santander is a small town in Spain, and actually it's a big Spanish bank. And that's the bit that sponsors the bike sharing scheme. So what's my relationship with Santander Cycles if I'm riding a bike? It's certainly not the same as this nice character called Oslo bicycle situation. And weirdly or interestingly or Difficult to prove, but Oslo Bicycle's maintenance costs are much lower than most bike sharing schemes. And I think, we think, talking to Urban Sharing, um, this is all their work, by the way, but that's because they've created a wider link with the city and people take more care of the bikes. It's very subtle in that relationship, the civic in between individual and the city. But in, in London, you know, I sort of know Santander can afford to pull a bike out of the canal if I put it back in the wrong place. So <laughs> they're a big Spanish bank. So again, I don't really think of them in the same way. They're not mine. You know, they're sort of theirs. Oslo bikes are mine if I'm living in Oslo. So they also share data openly with the city, the municipality, which again, most tech startups tend not to, or they ask for money back for that in some way. But urban sharing share all the data which enables the planners to see these interesting routes that they can maybe put a bus line around. Um, they paint the names of sort of common Oslo names on the bikes. People take Instagram photos of themselves riding the bike with their name on it. You know, it's all of these things are really subtly creating this civic relationship. I think for full Nordic brownie points, Oslo Bicycle use their, main, their maintenance crew is recently released Norwegian prisons from jail. So they're trained to fix the bikes in jail before they're released. They go back onto the streets, they go straight into a job, a meaningful job in society, a civic job. It's actually pretty pragmatic. I mean, it's this very lovely, I think, Norwegian or Nordic balance of pragmatism, deep, prag deeply pragmatic culture, 
as is often the case in places with bad weather. And uh, civic, sort of a harmonious civic sensibility or something wider than the individual, which you might call the Nordic model or in our country, the welfare state, but anyway. Um, so here they didn't have to do that, but they need a maintenance crew. And frankly, prisoners are probably fairly a cheap maintenance crew and they're good, you know. But there's a wider relationship there. It's clearly giving something back to the city at the same time. So here you can look at all of these three layers simultaneously. And to me, this is a classic strategic design principle. I was a Finnish architect in about 19, 1910 to so design a chair in the context of a room and the room in the context of a house and so on. All those scales are connected. They're all the same system. If you put air conditioning on a house, it doesn't actually cool the air. It just moves the warm air outside. So still the air is still warm if you just shifted the problem. So we have a, an issue with the fact that we parcel up and zone and, and put red lines around plots and so on. Saren is saying we need to see those connections, just like with the Oslo bike sharing scheme. So this kind of shifting lens is one of the first things I'll leave you with there about um, this engaging with the wider systemic impact of something. That's what we have to do now that we increasingly understand cities as systems or cities as assemblages, whatever you prefer. Um, Jean-Louis Miska, the deputy mayor of Paris, did a really interesting thing a few years ago about autonomous vehicles. He said, we should announce before 2020 that in Paris, no privately owned autonomous vehicle will be allowed. Only mobility as a service, not as ownership. So if Mary has a self-driving Tesla, she won't be able to drive into Paris. I'm sorry, Mary. But that's the principle. Now, it's, 2020 is here now, and Jean-Louis has had other things on his mind, so they haven't really done much about this. But I think that's what is our job, as again, as designers or urbanists or planners or activists or whatever you are, to understand that, to pick up the baton that he has put out there and say, well, how the hell is that going to work? So something my team um, did at Arab when, when he said that kind of thing, actually, when we were working for a large tech company, was understanding how could that work? And we made a short film just in a couple of days as a sketch. That was my old watch that you're seeing there. And that's the back wall of our studio. And we just overlaid, well, will Anna share a little bus? And how is that going to happen? How does the sharing happen? So we figured out you probably need something like a bus stop, but it can do other things while it's waiting. And it becomes a bus stop when, a, when an automotive shop is coming because they come on ad hoc on demand. And then another couple of people can walk past and you know, Ina and Ollie and my team at the time. Um, terrible acting, but anyway, that's not what they were employed for. They see that and get in. So it's no great kind of rocket science to understand the value of bus stop, but it's interesting to sort of take now Jean Louis's comment to say, well, how will that work? This is one tiny little micro interaction around that. And it's beginning to overlay those kind of questions, all of the questions implicit in Jean Louis Miska's statement. Will she get into a bus with strangers? Will she trade off time against money? How does it interplay with public transport, the wider end of things? And you also start thinking, well, how does that city feel with these constantly moving, flowing objects moving around us in slightly random ways? And well, funnily enough, this is, this is a film from Sydney in 1906. There'll be one of Toronto and Montreal and uh, so on. Uh, and that's just lovely to watch because you see this kind of ballet, what Jacob sort of called the ballet of the street playing out. I'll just play it back. But, you know, it's just sort of constantly flowing. The, the pavement is a suggestion. You know, it's not like a, a rule at all. It's like, it's almost like perfect jaywalking in action, <laughs> which I love because jaywalking is not even a law. It's stupid. But anyway, um, so that's what we sort of started sketching out. How would you get that kind of feeling? And then the second thing is, well, how do we then transform streets? Leaving aside the autonomous thing or not, generally and mary talked about all of the transformation happening so this was a separate project in melbourne a few years later for melbourne innovation district um looking at streets like this which are barely streets at all actually i mean it's just a parking lot really in theory is a street underneath that thing i mean the cbd is just behind those buildings at the back there so it's really close to the most valuable bit of melbourne and the university is just behind us and rmit universities to the left um but this is basically being used as a parking lot I mean, total waste of space so we said, okay, how do you transform this? The first thing we need to do is start gathering some data. And again, because of your recent episode in Toronto, you'll know, do that incredibly carefully. So we said, okay, and this needs to be very clearly led by the municipality, not by anybody else. The municipality is the only people where they're legitimately on behalf of speaking for the people, they're voted in in a democracy, they can kind of take this kind of move other than the community themselves, that's who you've got. Um, so it needs to say, okay, call Dan if you want to know more about this project, what the project is about, what the data is gathered, how do you get the data, what's it tracking, all of that stuff. That's marked on those little 
poles there. But that starts telling you a pattern of this tree. And then you realize you can probably shift the parking on the right hand side to the left hand side. Just angle the parking on the left. We're not even reducing the total volume of car parking at this point, we're just moving it. Enables you to paint, paint a bike lane on the right hand side. And in this render, you know, my team then put one of the people there not wearing a helmet. And it's actually against the law not to wear a helmet when you're cycling in Australia. And we did that on purpose to flush out the question here, the assumption of that. Could we get bike culture and safety to a point where you don't need to wear a helmet? Leaving aside whether it technically is a good or a bad thing to wear a helmet from a safety point, that's like a whole rabbit hole we don't need to go down right now, just to suggest that you could get the street that safe, as it is, let's say, in Amsterdam or Copenhagen would be very interesting in Australia. It starts a completely different discussion. Then we say, okay, we need to test this autonomous shuttle thing that we just heard about in Finland. This one's a French one, by the way. So we don't know if it works. We don't know if it works in Australia. I don't know if it works in plus 40 degrees centigrade, uh, which it can be at street side. So we need to see how that thing goes. What kind of journeys happen? But it's, a, it's a prototype, it's a test. This becomes then a picture, um, a ride share pickup point on the left. You put in a bit of amenity you can then start borrowing some greenery back from the park on the right and start building it with planter boxes. You still see everything here is movable, pretty much. Everything's a bit temporary. There's some flagstones gone in now, but everything else we can kind of back out of it's the wrong decision. Until you can make the big move, which is this beautiful bluestone paving, and then you can really begin to fill it up. And now you see we've completely transformed the center of the street. And of course, the value is completely different. Now, urban heat island mitigation is going on. The temperature is dropping five degrees in summer. It's doing stormwater mitigation, it's increasing social fabric, it's, it's increasing the air quality, it's, probably, it's certainly increasing business, it's increasing property value if that's what you want it to do and so on and so on. All of those things are coming out of this street now. Previously it was parking fees and that was it. The issue is, you know, I can't take those cars away just like that and like ping it to that. It's too easy to do that drawing. Really, any good architect can do that drawing. Um, uh, good architects in my team that did that drawing it wasn't me to be clear but i can't just pop from that to that if i'm in australia if i try and touch those cars those people will try and kill me basically i think it's almost like a human right to park so um you have to be very careful and do it step by step hence this kind of what we call an adaptive strategy not only does this enable you to test the tech as you go and that by tech i mean paving flagstones as much as i mean autonomous shuttles by the way or planter boxes they're all sorts of technologies and we need to test them and pivot and adjust. But we can also take people with us on that journey. We can set it a North Star. We say we want clean air, we want more um, resilient retail, we want, um, we want brain cancer to go down, we want stormwater mitigation to happen, so therefore cheaper maintenance costs, we want reduced healthcare costs. All of those things you can say are North Stars. But what we're not gonna do is promise we know every single step in advance. And unfortunately, planning pretends that you can do that currently. It's like, tell me in eight years exactly what it's going to be like and how much concrete you need. And we're saying, well, that's just not the way to make anything like uh, these days. But that's, nonetheless, we haven't really changed that culture. But this enables a very participative adaptive model. We, um, we took this model actually and also worked with, it with the, um, the city council in Amsterdam, the coming to in Amsterdam and looked at how you unhook parking from population in this way. So this kind of wiggly line again, um, then ended up in incredibly technical Dutch planning. Don't worry about that, but that's it actually changed the way that the city thought about how do we think about provision of these things where we can adapt and back out of it, almost parking with a use by date, like a pint of milk, if you like. Where they went in Melbourne was this plug and play kind of kit that you can start to build into those streets like that as well. So these are the sketches. This is the render, this is the real thing that came out, which is this kind of free floating, very adaptive, using the language of pop-ups, but done with quality to fit in the gaps in between the buildings and start effectively, I thought of them as like beginning to heal the landscape here of it. These otherwise dead spaces, hardscapes and parking spaces, you begin to see we pull in social fabric and greenery. And this also though is just a way of making decisions a bit more adaptable. And I love this quote from Schatzneider saying, uh, democracy is a political system of people who are not sure that they're right. And as a designer, I'm saying we're not sure we're right all the time. I mean, our job is to run towards the uncertainty and the ambiguity, <laughs> try to make sense of it. But that's a real like iterative ongoing struggle as a lot of you will know. Can't promise we know in advance. So you need to build in a slightly different way to enable that it does mean what I call an adaptive design strategy.
Then you've got the participation question. Right? How do you do this? How do you connect to people? I'll just talk about the technology of that. This is a film I made a few years ago. I think, um, the planning notices in the UK, which are the um, the things you put up saying there's going to be a big building here in two years' time. What do you think? Or it's going to be, we're going to change this road. What do you think? Or it's going to be, this uh, door is changing. What do you think? And you can turn yeah. your video down. We are hanging on every word, and the video is about to bounce out. Okay. I'll, I'll skip it actually. I'll skip it because that you get the gist. All we do in London, yeah, yeah. It, all we do in London, I, yeah. I put some Philip Glass under that film to make it extra sad, basically. But all we really do in a city like London is put up a piece of paper on a lamppost in the rain and ask you to have a look at it and then get in touch. And that, you know, in a city of untold wealth, basically, that's the best that most councils can do in terms of engaging people. I'm sure it's better in Canada, but it's often not better. Um, and that really, obviously, you know, doesn't really create a meaningful engagement at all. It's sort of, again, like, how do you like this plan? I've already decided. What we did in Helsinki at the time uh, when I was working there was we made this platform called Brickstarter, which was a prototype of a way that people could post ideas for spaces almost like taking Kickstarter and throwing it at urban planning, hence Brickstarter. And you could crowdfund things for sure. And of course, that was then a critique of crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is not democratic in any way, actually, of course, because it's very much based on funding and therefore projects that get more funding stand a better chance of getting up, which you could say is just life, but I just, again, point out it's not democratic. So we were looking at that and uh, there's a book we wrote about that, actually, which gets into these tensions of crowdfunding versus participation versus democracy versus this core idea though that you can make the city legible to people and post ideas their dreams for spaces i did this with brian boyer who mary knows who's a, a genius generally so then we took those kind of principles those affected the city of helsinki's participation strategy um, but then we started testing these new models for tech uh, a, bit, a few years later we started looking at things like augmented reality could you use the physicality of site models, work with people, enable them to move blocks around like this, but see the kind of impact of those decisions. So if Anna changes that block, you saw it change the solar gain on the roof, we can now make a different decision. She's informed about why it goes this way or this way. Or she might say, well, I prefer it this way because I can grow tomatoes. Fine. So then uh, with Ericsson, actually, we started looking at, you know, how you might do this kind of um, augmented reality using things like 5G networks, which Ericsson are interested in, obviously, finding use cases. for. So this is, again, purely speculative design. It's a sketch, of course. And it's showing you, again, this is proposals for the space, situated in the space. You can post modifications to those things, post comments to them, and things like this. So um, again, all sort of, minor, sort of minor steps forward, but not bad in themselves. I think what then the team at Ericsson did, working with UN Habitat, was really interesting, was that they they took those principles that we worked on with them from a strategic point of view, and they worked in Johannesburg with one of the Rafa bits there around Wits University, and they built the, the whole city around that place in Minecraft, based around a LiDAR model, because Minecraft is a nice modeling engine. And they, they then rigged it up a mobile phone that enabled you to work on the Minecraft modifications in the room and then go out in the streets and look through the phone's camera and see your modifications overlaid onto the real streets, just as our speculative thing showed. And um, so this is what you see through the camera. Obviously, if you know Minecraft, you can spot the Minecraft here, um, but you can also see the background. And this was a very early sketch demo, but it's kind of working, as you can see, it's kind of occluding the cars behind the things. And just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that that's the great bridge, by the way, <laughs> architecturally. It's what was more important though, is that people felt that they were making a mark on their city and we were doing it in a medium they were very comfortable with of course minecraft is actually super powerful as a modeling engine if you think about it um, but it, more importantly it was their tool the tool of those kids and the impact was amazing i'll just sort of run this and you can hear the sound yeah. Yeah. so this is guys uh, the students looking at their designs through the <laughs> So that delight is what we can unlock when you, we start working with participation in that way. And just to say, that's the sort of high-tech version. 
And another project we did in Sheffield around the same time in Sheffield in the UK, we just drew the plans differently. So a very talented dress person in my team, Agostino, uh, took the drawings from the planners, which are largely unintelligible to humans, I think, ex except planners, sorry, planners and just turned them into these little vignettes and a hand drawing of the entire city. I mean, it was, took him like three days to draw the whole city. And then we put them in the street and had conversations about them. And just by drawing it in pen, as opposed to a planning drawing, this is again, not rocket science, but it's just remarkable how very rarely this is done. This old guy who was about 130 years old, you know, it was like pointing at the top right, top left hand corner and saying, that's where my granddad used to keep cows, um, you know, in the 1850s or something, which is amazing. And we never would have had that conversation had it not been drawn like this. And Sheffield City Council said they got more participation around this than they'd ever done in the past. Then there's deeper participation, which is real co-design and ownership. And I think you know, Baugruppen in Berlin, these cooperative housing projects, which are just extraordinary. And these ones in Zurich, this is, enormous scale but led by cooperatives 50 co-ops making 13 buildings uh, the rent is 20 to 30 percent below market rate but incredibly high quality buildings way more sustainable usually than the market produces um, because you're able to take the developer's profit margin and plow it back into the project and it might take let's say six months longer but it actually doesn't take that much longer to be honest because you've already done the participation as part of the design phase instead of afterwards when you have to do the approvals. So it's incredibly powerful. You sort of think, why are we not using these projects for a solid proportion of our buildings? In Zurich, they voted to have almost a third of all of their buildings now in co-op mode, a third of private and a third of social housing. Mode. So this participative design changes what you build and it starts foregrounding these questions of ownership and care and maintenance, adaptation, a sort of incompleteness, which is, really how the city is made and used ongoing but we rarely think about that again or get to think about that from a planning and architecture point of view so another part of this is then how do you design the conditions to enable these projects to happen it's again it's all too easy to draw this this is a lovely drawing by effect architects for space 10 of some of their projects uh, space 10 at ikea's um r d lab um that's the kind of bit that is the fun bit of the project <laughs> making it happen the incredibly hard bit as you all know so the way we did there was saying, okay, well, how would you build the team around this? Not that specific project, but another project. This is Amsterdam City. And we're working with the same sort of tools we work with citizens, actually. Cut out bits of paper. These are new technologies coming in. These are new cultures. What should we do about them? How do we assemble them? Pulling a diverse team together around these projects. Same thing in Sheffield with the library. Uh, same thing in Stockholm with a new bit of Stockholm again. Just this is the these people usually never meet. They're different bits of the same municipality. And we did a we did a question at the end with them, having kind of unlocked a different project on the table this way, and said, okay, what would be the team that you could design to make this happen? And that was really interesting because the white dots here are the ones that they usually had: urban planner, landscape systems, architect, property development, basically. The other ones were things that were started coming from the team saying, okay, we really need a community liaison person, like a participation expert. We need health workers, artists, historians. These guys are usually introduced at some point in the project, but they're not part of the core design team usually. So this was really interesting how we we're beginning to suggest it's not about drawing the picture of what we want it to be. I mean, that's something to do, but creating the conditions to enable that to happen is far more important. So again, this is this kind of set of relationships around on the right hand side, the city council teams and how they begin to change in order to produce a different kind of city. An example of this kind of strategic work, I'll just talk about this, which is um, a project called, uh, well, it started from actually a community activity called Raventhal Pipe in Helsinki. It was very hard about 10 years ago to start a small cafe or, or a pop-up or a startup or like a little coffee shop or whatever. You had to fill in a lot of forms. The community were pretty unhappy about that because they knew that other things were available. <laughs> and so what they did was that they just sort of did an insurgency movement on the city itself. And what's happening here, if I screw it back, that woman is making egg and bacon sandwiches in her top, in her apartment there and lowering them to the street and selling them for five euros a pop. Basically, about 40 people had said, if we all do this on the same day at the same time, simultaneously, it's kind of illegal, but no one can stop us because we're all doing it at such scale in a distributed fashion. So it's sort of amazing. The city changed like this. This is an Argentinian woman making empanadas in her 
first floor window, that's a woman dressed as an empanada in the foreground advertising the place. That's my son at the time, once going here. And I didn't know there was an Argentinian woman living there in this apartment until the empanadas appeared and I was living around the corner. It was amazing. You know, so the city as streets do when you unlock them came alive. The regulations were just stopping this stuff dead for reasons of the usual reasons, health and safety, cost efficiency, things like that. But it was interesting seeing the citizens themselves again use this sort of moment to say we can actually launch a social movement saying no we want a kind of street food here this is a thai soup kitchen in the park and you just see it's kind of beautiful it's totally illegal <laughs> none of them have a permit to do this to sell make and sell food in public so it's very you know it's very complex because like what does the city council we talked to the deputy mayor what did they do about it and he was like i can't really arrest them to be the worst PR ever. So they just sort of let it go. He went onto their Facebook page and said, okay, have a nice day, be safe. It was the least sort of liability he could admit for it. I mean, so these women are making uh, egg and bacon uh, flans, you know, they're hardened criminals basically, but um, clearly not at the same time. It's such good urbanism, you can't really stop it. They use Facebook to organize it because that's a weapon grade level tool for organizing. They made four mobile apps across four different systems simultaneously. Um, in a way that, again, no municipality could do that. I did that over a weekend for free. And the city changed. What didn't change, though, because pop-ups popped down, is that regulations didn't change. So this lovely kind of usually vacant kiosk went back to this after restaurant day. This is just like a one-day thing. It then started running every four months, and it ran for four years, spread to 70 countries worldwide. It became a kind of amazing movement. Um, at which point Helsinki city government were really interested, but it was still kind of illegal and regulation hadn't changed. So what did we do? Well, we said, well, we don't need to do the street food thing because clearly people know how to do that. And we don't need to teach them how to cook because they're really good at that. What we need to do is wrangle the bureaucracy around it into a different form and sort of get into what I call the dark matter about why is it so hard to set up a little cafe? So we set up a kind of set up a cafe school basically called Open Kitchen. And we worked with the top chefs in the city. We ran a campaign for people to apply, almost like a master chef style thing. This is people then running this where they learn then not so much how to cook actually, despite what this picture shows, but how to open a restaurant, how to fill in the forms, how to find a space, how to hire a team, how to get licenses, all of those kinds of things. Where to get organic vegetables, which isn't immediately obvious, even if you go to catering school. And so really interesting and actually a very diverse group of people, despite what this picture looks like. Um, we have people from Somalia as part of this, who have just moved to Helsinki, people from Spain and so on. So it really foregrounded a bit with my like Argentine anecdote. Um, who decides what street food can be? Who decides what food can be? Who decides what the street's about? And how do we enable the system to learn about a new kind of diversity that's in the city at this point? Helsinki isn't the way it was in 1980. We don't need that kind of street food. We need empanadas, basically. So how do you, how do you regulate that? So crucially, we worked with this guy, Vilo Relander, who is the City of Helsinki Food Project Manager. He was able to absorb the learning from this work via us as the interface and absorb that back into the city and just begin to make subtle changes. And so this, don't worry about the words, but basically, Stuff happens on the left. Some of it's to do with us, some of it's much more to do with citizens and what they did. That was by far the biggest impact. Some of it's to do with Vile. And then over the right hand side, you see via a wiggly, wiggly line, which is incredibly horrible to trace, um, things change. The police change, the public works department change, the environment center opens up, and so on. Eventually, down the bottom, the city hired the founder of, let's call it the insurgency movement, Restaurant Day, to become the head of the food culture strategy team. So they absorb the, the kind of culture into the bureaucracy the institution. I'd argue that's a very good thing. That wasn't killing the culture, that was the city council learning. So this is making the context. And I talk about that in this kind of stuff, the strategic design book. So I'm just gonna pause, I'm just gonna now just make my last point and then we can talk. Um, this is now moving me to Sweden and the mission oriented work we're doing now. We're working very closely with Mariana Mazzucato, who's an Italian American economist, some of you might know, and looking at how do we drive this new type of innovation from the government side again, the public sector side, which is directly addressing systemic issues and challenges around climate resilience, public health, and social justice at the same time, understanding they're all absolutely linked. COVID makes this clearly super clear in a way that probably nothing else ever has before. So there's, there's Mariana, and uh, we're working in a few areas. 
And we're, of course, inspired by movements like uh, Paris's 15-minute city and Oslo getting rid of its parking spaces. I'm going to talk about our mo mobility project now. Uh, Barcelona super blocks. I'm sure you're aware of these things, and I know there are equivalents happening in Canadian cities. Um, so the mission we're setting out in Sweden is again, so how do we do this really systemically? We really, I want to ensure, in fact, we're building the capability to flip every street, not just the easy ones, not just the ones in the center, not just the ones that uh, we can do with pop-ups, but then they pop down, not just in summer, because we have some summer streets programs, but actually all year. So that every street is healthy, sustainable, and vibrant. And I mean vibrant in the sense of with life in it. And that life could be a busy Friday night downtown kind of life, or it could be a very quiet street with just birds and butterflies, don't really mind. Ideally both. Um, but they're both life, right? But all of them have to be healthy. I can't pick this street here and say, okay, that's the healthy one, and all of those are unhealthy. From our point of view, from an equality point of view, it has to be all of them. And we're looking then, obviously, we can look at the, as I showed you with the Melbourne stuff earlier, the multiple types of outcomes that you unlock from a, this systemic approach. You can decrease, potentially decrease domestic violence using greenery in different ways. You can increase physical health. You can decrease maintenance costs and healthcare costs. You can increase economic performance all at the same time through the same kind of moves. Usually, however, the street is approached as one thing, despite the fact it's a complex system we've sort of given the streets to the traffic departments to run. So as a result, if you give the street to traffic, you get traffic planners, you get traffic. Again, with all due respect to my traffic planning colleagues, but the clue's kind of in the name. If we gave the street to gardeners, you get gardens, right? So how do we open up the kind of diversity in there? So we're looking at how do we put multiple questions into this complex thing called the street and pull multiple types of outcome out simultaneously, what you might call co-benefits. So these are the design sessions we do around that, where we're pulling in, again, very different organizations. We've got high school students on the right-hand side, and we've got car-sharing companies on the left-hand side, all drawing on the same bits of paper. These are the amalgam drawings I pulled out of these workshops. Again, there's kind of systemic thinking underneath this. I don't want to overplay this. It looks a bit analytical. It's not really, but this is just giving us kind of repeated patterns and insights coming from the Actually, we've talked to about 400 different organizations through these multiple workshops. And we find these kind of intervention points. What if we could build a kit that moves across parking spaces, parklet style, if you know that program, parking day, but begins to glue together systemically, again, to change the street. And what if, again, it's not done purely by activists, but the government makes the kit for activists to use? So we're looking at the wider glue, the systemic outcome. And what we're able to do then is say, okay, let's, let's start with some streets. And we, we, the people we have designing the streets in the first instance, in this case, were school kids. We chose streets around schools. The street outside the school, effectively, who's best to design that? Well, the school kids are. So that's what's happening in the first instance. We've also done the same technique, by the way, with our prime minister, who's that person there, Stefan Levine, and the health minister next to him, to, his, to, to the right. Uh, I won't tell you who is better at this exercise, by the way, but this is what came out of the kids' um, <laughs> design sessions. And it's lovely, of course, because kids are very good designers. Um, outdoor gyms, fake palms, seating, and so on. And we're beginning to set a sense of the transformation. Then we, we run those through some architecture firms and the city's planning department, and it begins to feel like this. These street elements then become this kit of parts. Now we're thinking this is kind of like, almost like a Lego or Ikea-like system made out of timber, by the way, cross-laminated timber that you can stretch and adapt to fit the street like a kind of stretchable boardwalk. And the boardwalk is an inspiration for us because we have a lot of those in Sweden. I'm sure you do in Canada. This is the timber now turning up um, at the factory. We started this a year ago and now it's kind of beginning to be machined and it's going into these streets uh, this month. So they're beginning to be alongside other things like proper planting and so on, where it's testing these elements. And it's very, very small steps. I don't want to overplay this, but this is a system that could theoretically scale across the country because you know what? Parking spaces are everywhere. We've built more parking space than we built residential space in Sweden. There's 40,000 kilometers of street like this. And you can approach that as code. You know, there's like one parking space law that governs the whole thing. We unlock that law in this way. The whole country becomes addressable like that. But crucially, who decides what happens there? Well, the street does. And that's where we're trying to get the participation model so that the street itself, the residents and the users of the street, effectively use the kit to decide what they want to have there and they can modify the kit. So it's like an open source kit of parts in that way. 
And this, um, you know, really foregrounds the political aspect of this tree, actually. Political as in making decisions about shared assets, shared decisions about shared things. Uh, I love this quote from Seski Assassin about the street being where new forms of the social and political can appear. And it's, of course, no accident that we've been, been through this very strange year so far, um, amazingly um, horrifying and also full of some, how do I put it, kind of notes of light at the same time as Mary put it in the introduction, which is kind of, in, you know, just too complex to think about, but it's happening on the street. COVID clears the street, Black Lives Matter fills the street, which is sort of, the street is where those things play out. So it's kind of, again, no accident that this is where it happens. It's no accident that protesters march across the freeways that cut um, African-American communities apart in the US, in the same way I showed you in Sweden with the freeway at the start. And it's, I think it's really interesting and inspiring what's come out of that movement, these deep questions about, Okay, how do we take a space? Fine, but then what do we do with it? And this is, I think, really like this quote from Nikita Oliver, mayoral candidate in Seattle, so that it actually serves the community. And again, this is getting over the sort of pop-ups, pop-down problem. Uh, you can organize a protest march, but then what? She's really saying, no, we need to go deeper. We need to lock this in now. And it's all kinds of questions. This is a lovely installation at Arc Des called Meadow, um, or Infield rather, by Linda Tegg, the Australian artist, which is just asking about how, what is greenery in public space? And uh, this just begins to feel like, well, this could begin to move across the streets that I just talked about. Um, the really powerful work, I think, around biodiversity at the moment that uh, Julia Watson is documenting with her book, Low Tech, about in nature-based technologies that indigenous communities have been working on for about 40,000 years in some cases. How does this begin to meld with cities? Incredibly interesting question. I think probably the big question coming next. All of this is about how do we move our mental model? You know, like what's going on in this so-called Overton window? So I'll just close by just talking about what's happening right now, this kind of sense that we're in this funny moment, uh, funny, not ha-ha, odd, peculiar moment where the corona curves are coming and going and things are sort of shifting up and down accordingly. The first curve, of course, flattened cars right away. My drawing here suggests that we have a question as to what cars go back to, just as we do with aviation. Aviation is sort of dead as a dodo at the moment, more or less. Um, aviation bosses are saying, yeah, it might take four or five years before it's back to normal. I'm sort of asking, what does it go back to is part of the question here. It doesn't have to go back up to 100% of what it was, absolutely. Given that, you know, only about 15% of the planet has, own, has flown, that's the total number of people that have ever been in, an avi in, a, in an airplane, <laughs> about 15%, 18%, I think, of the population. And yet we sort of devote so much time and space, like the amount of space given to airports and airport expansion alone, that's got to be a question at this point, having turned the engines off. So the question about, you know, how does the traffic flatten and then what does it go back to? Do we want, I can put the trade off like this, birdsong or traffic. Birdsong diminishes as traffic increases. So birds were struggling to make themselves heard over car traffic, probably in Toronto as much as anywhere. Um, question, what should it be? How does the street pan out once we go through it? Is it about vehicles largely, or do we want to shift the balance to these other things? These are the kind of questions in front of us. I say us, we, it's not me saying this. It's, this is a decision we have to take. This is public space. So finally, there's, a, there's an opportunity to think about this in a, in a very powerful way in terms of mental models. Mary and I talked about this before the talk. You know, this is super informed thinking, so forgive me, but in the spirit of provocation. Um, Danny Dorling is an Oxford University ge geographer. He just pointed out that most things are beginning to slow down. <laughs> most things. So most patterns of data associated with growth, what you might call the great acceleration, are beginning to tail off. That doesn't mean they're stopping. You know, Shanghai is getting bigger. But its rate of growth is now slowing down. World population is now slowing down. These are kind of graphs he has in this chart of just Indian population slowing down. The Japanese population, as you probably know, is absolutely slowed down. Japan and Italy are theoretically really half the size of the population in 2100. Half the size of what they are now. Uh, world population getting less and less every time someone runs the numbers. <laughs> so it's not that it's not growing again. And yes, of course, Canada and places like that are growing, but the rate of change is slowing down. So I was looking at the kind of Canadian statistics, I think it's called Statistics Canada, I'm speculating. You see these prognoses about how Canada will grow. And these numbers, I'm just saying, are changing now 
all the time. Again, not to freak people out and say it's, it's going to drop because it's going to grow, but the rate of growth, which drives a lot of the economic thinking, will change. So, for instance, the UN population forecast now are now thought to be 2 billion out by many, many researchers in this field, which is a big number. So what do we do about that? Well, part of it is goes back to things like actually, I think it was like 15 minute city in Paris, super interesting. Adrian Lahoud's work around post-traumatic urbanism is absolutely something to think about now, which is basically knitting the city back together in these far more diverse distributed ways. Um, we've seen similar things like that after World War II. This is Aldo van Eyck's playgrounds in Amsterdam that were built in bomb sites or the end of streets and began to kind of heal the city in this very distributed, almost what I call like a polka dot pattern. Not a big centralized central park model, but multiple small pieces loosely joined. You see this right now, this is shift architecture and urbanism's plan for Rotterdam markets. Not three big central food markets, but actually 50 or 40 or 50 small local neighborhood markets, far more diverse, more embedded in the community, more surface area, if you like, more possibility of diversity. So it becomes more like this pattern of dots as opposed to two or three big ones. So the last thing I'll say is that there are examples of that at the scale of Rotterdam and these nice cozy European cities. Uh, Rotterdam is not that cozy, people have been there, but you know what I mean. But also Tokyo is like that. And Tokyo is like the biggest urban area in the world, more or less. So, you know, it's sort of, we can talk about scale in an interesting way here. Doling shows Tokyo's population, you know, it's more or less at, at a halt. It stopped growing out to the suburbs. What's, that's what this graph shows. It stopped growing out into the center. The kind of pendulum is just settling now. You end up with a kind of a, then there's no one center of Tokyo. There's just hundreds. And that's actually based on the tube or the metro network, the subway network. There's, each of those is a little base. And once you get out of the station there, you're in this, which are these very walkable, very small, humble back streets, which are just beautiful and full of life and possibility and diversity in different ways and quiet and noisy and safe and interesting, all simultaneously. The, the logistics looks like this. <laughs> which is sort of extraordinary. The architecture is, can be incredible or banal, but it's, it's constantly churning itself in the same spot. It's repairing and healing itself. It's not rapidly accelerating. It's actually been just slowing down and making things more carefully. So you find these tiny pocket moments of repose, which is sort of fascinating. So this is what I talk about. Yes, 15 minute city, but the one minute city of the street, the thing outside your front door, that's where we can talk about really regenerative landscape, right? real shared ownership and participation at that scale. And the one minute and the 15 minute, you know, and the 30 minute or whatever, they all fit inside each other like Russian dolls. There's relationships between them, but I think it's very powerful to start talking about these kind of scales of, again, one minute. So this kind of slowdown of everything, potentially, doesn't mean the end of economy, it doesn't mean the end of progress, it actually means a switch towards social progress rather than growth for the sake of growth. Japan, to some extent, tells that story. Other places beginning to tell that story. And this is this transition on around climate resilience, human and non-human health, and social justice. And that this is all intertwined at the same time. So I'll, I'll finish with a quote by a writer I love called Gautam Ban in India. And he talks about the postponing. He's writing about Indian smart cities, actually, which is a classic kind of great acceleration moment. And he says, it's just been a failure. The postponement of that is also the survival of the ordinary and the everyday, the survival of citizens over city and of infrastructures of everyday dignity over big signature spectacular projects. And I think that is in its own way as spectacular as the big project, the infrastructure of everyday dignity. Um, that would be a good point to end the talk, I think. That's for something for us to think about now. Thank you very much for listening. Um, sorry if I went on a little bit, but Mary, back to you. Dan, fabulous. Uh, just terrific. Just terrific to have you. Uh, and it, you, I, I've been wondering the chat, having lots of exchanges with people and they've been fascinated. Just to reassure everyone, yes, the broadcast will be posted. Yes, you'll be able to see the slides, et cetera, et cetera. And it would be interesting if maybe one of our colleagues will be able to actually do a distillation of some of the uh, references you've made because you refer to a lot of people through your talk. And uh, sure. we could maybe, maybe we'll create a little resource page um, so people totally can I can send you I can send you footnotes <laughs> yeah well, exactly we'll take the footnotes and we'll post those because I know I'm like I'm sure I've been making notes as I've been listening and fabulous pull quotes and lots of provocation for folks so I'm going to invite Cynthia and Zara to turn their video on 
and hopefully they will join us there. Magically, there is Zara Ibrahim uh, coming in from Toronto and there's Cynthia Dorrington coming in from Halifax. This is modern technology. So we have, at least we did have Cynthia there, she's there. So we've got, um, uh, we've got three different time zones and we appreciate that Dan is delaying his supper uh, to be able to continue with us. And um, That's fine. Uh, I'm wondering if we could, uh, I've got lots of questions and notes, but I'm going to first go to you, Cynthia, to just offer a few of your observations and questions, just to start us off. And then Zara, you can chime in and Dan, you can respond as we go. And if people want to put more questions up on the chat, please go ahead and do so. And I'll try to feed them into the conversation. So over to you, Cynthia. Dan, your discussion was fantastic. It really is uh, the people who have to ascertain how we move forward as a city, a town, a community. I think most importantly, a lot of what you've spoken about really is how we plan the future for where we live, how we implement that, how we evaluate it, and how we adjust. And it's like a circle of life in, in regards to looking at a circle of uh, the community and how your community continues to evolve. I think most importantly, as a community, as a city, and in and where we live at, we have to take into account the various people that live here, that work here, that play here. And I think sometimes the decisions from the past were always the municipalities or the city councillors off the day. And, um, and I think now we have to look differently at what we, as citizens living in, in our communities, what we need for the future. Uh, you made a very good point in one of your slides when you talked about uh, automobiles. And I think COVID has changed our world and we have the opportunity now to change the narrative. We have the opportunity to have the discussion on what that looks like because we will be creating the new society or the new norm. Uh, we mm -hmm. are never go back to how we were in the past. This is the time. And actually, this is a really great point and a really great conversation to have right at this time as we start to open up our cities and trying to determine what does the city look like as we move forward. Uh, as we know, masks are in Canada, and, and I'm in Nova Scotia, so masks are mandatory in our province now. So when we can talk about different components of what is required for our people to be safe, I think planning the city talks about the safety. It allows you as a citizen to be a part of uh, what that city looks like. It also is inclusive of the diversity that the city brings, the richness of that city. And it also talks about what the city is going to look like as we move forward and what it needs to look like as we move forward. So great conversation. I took quite a few notes and I'm glad that Mary mentioned that we probably get a slide deck because it really talks to engagement at this point. And I think this is the time to have the engagement and start the discussion. It's a changing world. And we're in the point of change, and this is a change that it's going to be for the better for all, all cities, towns, communities across the globe. Mm. Thank you, Cynthia. That was great. Zara, do you want to throw in a couple of comments, and then we'll get down to respond, and I'll feed some stuff in from the chat. Yeah, for sure. I too have lots of notes, and I couldn't decide so on my computer, on my notebooks. I'm looking everywhere. <laughs> um, you know, Dan, I, I also really appreciated the talk. I've, you know, as we were talking before before we went live, I've really appreciated your work, um, mostly because at an institutional level, you've talked about how do we integrate participatory practice as our orientation to practice as city builders. Yeah. Um, and so I really appreciate this sort of leveling power that happens when we do that kind of work and making the future of the past so that people can actually engage with what they're designing. I think what I want to comment on is uh, a yes and to everything um, and and appreciating that in the chat there's a lot of questions around can this happen in Toronto are we doing this are we doing enough there was a great reflection on Vancouver and I want to sort of reflect a little bit on why I think this isn't happening um, in this moment and you know ultimately you know it, it comes down to the crisis of you know, distribution of power and resources. Who's asking the question about which interventions we're doing a participatory design project around? Um, who is sort of directing the, the goals that municipalities are making choices around? Um, and so, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about one of your books, uh, Dark Matter, Trojan Horses, and I think I have it right when you talk about a plot, like 
you know, using a plot device to do something bigger, a MacGuffin. Um, and mm -hmm. for me, co-design is very much a plot device to advance the conversation on power in cities and who has it. Uh, yeah. Because if you do the project, you see all the people who are surprised by engagement, by getting the opportunity to interact. And there's your data, right? These are the folks mm. that are not actually typically interacting. So mm. I guess the, the question or, or a comment I would put out is, you know, one of the things I've been doing recently is um, interrogating my own participatory design practice. And one of the things that's become so obvious has been the, you know, who the proverbial we is collecting the data, making the decisions and doing the analysis. And yeah. I've just finished a project where my colleague Kofi Hope and I have done a scan of municipalities across the country um, looking at how their engagements and participatory projects engage or don't engage equity seeking groups. And only one municipality, I really hope you're on the call, Grand Prairie, Alberta, because you were the only one who in your content talks about analyzing the data. So collecting is one thing, but the bias that uh, comes with taking all the information you got from a participatory engagement and then going away and turning it into something beautiful and an actual designer intervention is the piece I think that we're really missing. And I know it's very specific and very nitty gritty, but I think we talk about co-creation. We don't talk about mm. analysis and decision-making piece. Mm. Um, so, so just one, one more thing and then, um, and then I'll stop talking, but the beauty of being a speaker that's off video uh, for the first 45 minutes is I get to go collect all my favorite artifacts, which I did. Uh, <laughs> and I, I grabbed Antoinette Carroll's Equity-Centered Community Design Field Guide, um, okay. which I hope we can link to. But I think the real way to start using the, all of the things we've talked about in deeply shifting power is these, she has these three circles, I'll read them. Don't worry, I'm not expecting you all to read them. Um, but she has these three core circles that really amplify the impact of the things you talked about. The first being understanding the historic moment that we're in, whatever historic moment we're in, we're always in one. Um, the history and healing that needs to happen for people to actually engage given the context of the moment. And then acknowledging and dismantling power constructs, then going into co-design. Um, and that can be done in small, medium, large, extra large ways. Uh, but I think that that piece is the piece I would layer into all of your uh, suggestions around co-design. Uh, Zara, we super, super the requests for the study too. I'll, so. I'll, I'll, uh, the study is not live yet. It will be live later this fall. Um, it was a partnership between the city of Toronto, Greg Lintern, who's on the call, our chief planner, and the Wellesley Institute. So it'll be live later this fall. Okay, Dan, go ahead and respond and then to what both Cynthia and Zara said, whatever you want to offer. And then I've got, so I've got a list of things I want to pull in from the chat. Yeah, um, thank you both, Cynthia and Zara. I mean, really, I mean, uh, you know, my, my mind is now spinning with a lots of yes ands. <laughs> so um, just to, on the last point, Zara, I think, yeah, I feel like we're in Sweden, the work I'm doing now is so um, improvised, actually. I must, I'm, I'm just going to be honest about that. You know, we're really trying to push quite a long way, as you can see, in a way that uh, I'm, I'm, we're possibly moving too quickly. I just saw one of the comments flash back about people with disabilities. And I literally had this conversation this morning about um, the lip on that piece of wood looks a little bit uh, blunt to get a wheelchair over, you know, like so, which I would have liked the designers to have thought about a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, that's the kind of, we're, we're sort of at that stage of the project. And so, Equally, the first four streets that have been done, the schools that were available to do that with, which Stockholm municipality made available, I would kind of file under, again, if I'm honest, the easy ones, as in <laughs> they're in the kind of inner suburbs, city center, as in they're sort of relatively, um, in the, the less like perfect examples of 19th century streets that have just been totally underused, you know, but they're not in um, a tougher bit of town, basically. And so we're having a conversation with places like uh, Husby and Rinkeby in Stockholm, which are more, much more challenged communities in mul multiple ways about how do we play that same process out there and what can we learn from that? So I've set this up as a massively learning process. Me giving you this, me giving you this talk is for me massively learning and now I have a, um, Antoinette's reference to follow up. So thank you. Um, because when you're doing this, you realize you're unpicking so much simultaneously. You're sort of unpicking the entire practice of planning, the whole focus of the municipality, 
the value model with which we judge streets by, which is not just cost and efficiency, but could be, in my case, social justice, climate resilience, and public health, you know, like that's 180 degree shift. <laughs> Technically, there's a million things to get through. There's like understanding the parking space law, what perennial shrubs might work in winter, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff at the same time. And I love it because it's working in a way, like I'm trying to find what I call these everyday complex objects, like streets and schools and farms and forests that have all of those things simultaneously. But as with my funny arrow diagram, where it's going from one arrow, which is the easy one, easy way to manage a street for traffic, to all of the arrows, um, it's just incredibly challenging. So I'm aware sometimes when I give the talk, particularly, you know, sort of like this from a long way away and you can't see in my body language, it might look more considered than it is. <laughs> and actually, I'm, I'm just kind of, um, I'm moving in all directions simultaneously, trying to explore how we as a system can change, because that feels like, the right thing to do to roll up the sleeves and, and dig in and learn through doing by making something. But I think that's what I took from both of your comments, actually, both, both of you both were both very kind of careful and considered. And I sort of now feel like I should probably, I need to rethink a couple of things about the way we're approaching it, either the communities we're doing it with, or um, you mentioned history, both of you in different ways. And the last thing you want is like a white male European talking about reparations. But, um, but we are in that context right now of, that's why I use repairing as a, as a verb, absolutely, with the kind of projects we're doing. And so it's, yeah, for me, it's incredibly challenging, but completely thrilling at the same time. And I'm, I just enjoyed your responses and, and what's going on in the chat, which is kind of like a whole Yes, there's a whole, right. there's an, we always say that there's a whole parallel universe in the chat and we've benefited <laughs> from that and the chat people start to have a whole relationship with each other. You guys are really incidental to them. They're having a good time on their own. Time. I know, exactly. It's like uh, they're in the and, kitchen. <laughs> and I, mean, I, I want to just pursue a couple of things. This notion of linearity, you were talking about how the street, you know, is this, but actually the street is all these things. And I think our yeah. Green street work has highlighted this first. We're wondering whether we should be renaming it, bring bring back or bring forward your street, that the street is everything and it's not, and it's the fundamental building block that connects us. And, and it, for some reason, people of our age think it's only about cars, but we, we don't have, I mean, I, and I think people want to know where those little films came from, even though the sound, we couldn't always hear the sound because it was fighting with your voice, but that the yeah. little Swedish film of the guy trying to halt the traffic, I think people want to, I think a lot of people are keen to see that one again. I know, I need to like find who that guy was and give him posthumously a medal of some kind, yeah, but it's yeah, just, yeah. you will have films like that in Canada. I found, I said, one of the old films was from Australia. Like the yeah. National Archives will have films. I just went Google, or rather actually used that search engine to find traffic films in the 1930s and you'll just find them for sure there you go That's so instructive there's your tip use google so with, <laughs> and let's talk about winter we, we in the northern hemisphere are hunkering down now uh there's snow in colorado uh four states mm -hmm. over there are forest fires today um uh, we have parts of canada that are anticipating snow will fly sooner rather than later we seem to have mucked about in terms of getting people into patios and uh, vibrant street life. What is your sort of sense of what we should be focusing on as we head into the colder months? Mm. I don't think, it, I, I think it's just a challenge, right? It's not a, it's not a showstopper. And I think it's that, it's that shifting of the emphasis from saying the street is for traffic. Therefore, for instance, maintenance by um, snow clearers is super important. I remember doing, seeing this in Helsinki for the first time, which as you know, is pretty cold. And seeing many streets just denuded of trees and then pulling on that thread and discovering that basically city council officials said, well, it's just easier to get the snow clearer through if there's no trees on the street. And you sort of like, uh, are we making, are we making the streets for the snow clearers, you know, or, so that's what I mean by these 108 degree shifts. So I, I have every confidence in people's creativity to figure out ways to live outside when it, I mean, here it gets to minus 20 degrees. Um, we have a this saying in Sweden, as you know, it's like, there's no, you probably have exactly the same saying and claim it's yours, but there's no such thing as bad weather, there's mm -hmm. just bad clothing. <laughs> so, and in Swedish that's better because uh, clothing is kleder and it rhymes with veda, which is weather. But anyway, so like, so what the question is, what's the good clothing for the street? 
right. super interesting design brief. And as someone else in the chat said, landscape architects have been figuring this out for years. Absolutely have. And I was, I was then we'd also, there's a lovely, other, another quote from Aldo van Eyck, who is the Dutch architect who did the playground thing I mentioned briefly. And then you can dig this one out, but he just talks about how kind of when it snows, it turns the whole city into a playground. You know, it's like kids just love it because they know exactly what to do. There's no cars. Everything kind of goes quiet, as you know. Then you get all these funny mounds and shapes, which might be cars, might not. And so for it's just that lovely idea that it just becomes this playground all of a sudden, and then the snow melts and it kind of goes again. So it can be canopies, it can be, you know, like it can be different types of planting. There's just numerous ways. And yes, it needs to work for elderly and young alike, and it needs to be safe and secure. That's like a no-brainer, but it's but I think that's I just think it's such an interesting design challenge and it's one that is not asked. I tell you, it's just not asked because basically the street is well, that we just shut down for five months, you know, and uh, the snow clearers can get through, but nothing else is going on there. <laughs> and yeah. that's just the biggest waste of our biggest asset. It's just like, right. you know, 25, 30% of every city is street. Right. And it's, and it's, and it's owned by the public. It's owned by us. Mm -hmm. um, just exactly. Chat again, a question about, um, we're in this time of experimentation and and COVID's given us permission to accelerate things and suddenly we have to figure out what to do with homeless folks. We have to figure out how we can get bikes on the roads. We have to figure out how to get down. How do, what's your comment? And I'd be interested, Cynthia and Zara weighing in on this too. What about the tension that's causing? We're starting to get neighborhoods that are objecting. We're getting people that are irritable. How do we foster a kind of collective acceptance of the experimentation maybe maybe either cynthia or zaria if either of you want to jump in before dan does please do mm. um thoughts yeah you can you go i think what you have to do is you just can't make a decision without understanding first of all the people that it's going to impact the most which are the homeless people find out what some of their needs are um, and it might be, some things might be pretty simple and we're really complicating it because we have not addressed it with them or, or found out what their needs are. And I find sometimes we impose what we think is right on, on folks yeah. or uh, even for that matter on city streets. Uh, when, when you were talking, uh, Dan, and, and this is a really great one in regards to the streets themselves, right, right now, we, from a COVID perspective, we're using them as an extension of restaurants here in Halifax. So some mm -hmm. of our streets, we have either shut down and became a, um, a walking street, and or we have reduced the parking on the street to accommodate uh, allowing more of a sidewalk and allowing the restaurants to bring their um, tables out. And that's social distance. And it's allowing the restaurants to, to come back up. They're not gonna see the revenue that they would have seen without COVID, but needless to say, they are still in existence. How do we continue to do that as we move into the winter? There are some cities that do use their sidewalks. Like when we look in Paris in the cafes, they, they don't close down for the winter. They use the outside area in a way that's meaningful. How do we in Canada do the same thing? Um, exactly. We can do that. But when we're talking about how we look at uh, our winter coming up, the impact is going to have on the homeless people, the parking on the streets. Um, even here over this spring time frame, they put in areas downtown now that actually have a permanent bike lane. So we have taken out one whole side of the street from a, a, a parking perspective. So reduce parking by 50% uh, in some of the streets, put in a permanent park lane, which actually is almost like a, a a level of a sidewalk that from a cleaning perspective is going to be crazy to clean because vehicles can't clean with because they're not going to clean on a sidewalk and they can't clean so we're I'm thinking I don't know whose idea it was it definitely wasn't mine but I don't know whose idea it was to do something like this without thinking about the impact it's going to have from a cleaning perspective in the winter time so I think mm -hmm. we actually have to engage the community and sometimes no idea is a stupid idea. I always find ideas are from people's lived experiences or from their experiences from travel. Sometimes people traveling will come up with different experiences or different ideas to promote to a city that, guess what? This is not something that they are used to, 
but mm -hmm. it will work and can be adapted. And I think we have to look at adaptation as we look at these uh, ideas mm -hmm. and talk about what the winter is going to look like and the impact that COVID's had. But ultimately, a street really, when I look at a street and when I walk down streets or I drive down streets, it really defines the people that live on that street. And yeah. those create neighborhoods, and that creates a community. Yeah, totally. Sorry, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll just quickly, the, uh, not much more to add except for the fact that right now our streets are doing, you know, I, Cynthia, I really appreciate this sort of what do people need rooting it in the human centeredness. And the streets are doing the job for us right now here in Toronto. We've got restaurants, we've got, you know, additional public space, we've got additional sidewalk space. But it's also doing the job of showing us that someone is paying attention. When a restaurant, when a patio shows up in my neighborhood, I feel like someone's paying attention. And I'm proximate right now to a study that's talking about in neighborhoods where there's high percentages of folks uh, who are living um, or experiencing homelessness, mental health issues, uh, high concentrations of newcomers. Their, mm. their civic and political engagement is directly connected to mm. how they perceive their neighborhood is cared for. So I, I think it's really interesting thinking of the multiple jobs that the streets are doing for us right now. And one of it is if you put something on my street that's useful to me, I feel more engaged. I feel like someone is paying attention to the place I live. And so all yeah. that to say, how do we get, you know, the folks who are in my backyard not wanting, not wanting change? You know, the mm -hmm. hopeful uh, side of COVID, there's a few glimmers of hope within this um, wild time we're living in. But it's that, that sort of Lila Watson quote around our liberation being bound. If uh, you've come here to help me, then you're wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, let us work together. Um, right. I think we're getting away from charity and we're more into solidarity. Uh, hopefully, yeah. we're not there. I'm, I'm not that hopeful, but, but I think we're moved from the charity model to the solidarity model because we do mm. see that we need folks who run restaurants and, and you know serve at restaurants for our mental health and that's mm. not their first choice is to be out there and so I, I, yeah. I think it's a really interesting moment uh around our collective liberation and starting to reestablish what the common good is because i think we're starting to really pay attention to what it means to be a frontline worker a minimum wage worker and all of that that some people are being slightly more charitable um in ways that they wouldn't have been typically been before so last yeah. word to you, Dan. Sadly, we're going to have to bring the session to an end, but if you want to make a few closing comments, that would be great. Yeah, maybe um, there's some great things in the chat. Again, as usual, it's kind of hard. I'm using like 1% of my brain on the chat, 99% listening to Zara and Cynthia. But um, just point, you know, different techniques for the street. I remember someone talking about colonnades, which in, you know, Turin in Italy is a very rainy city, actually. They have like 26 kilometers of colonnades built into the buildings. It's been there since the 15th, 16th century. Completely works. Works in summer, works in winter. You don't really have to try hard around these things. It's just understanding that the street, again, is for something other than traffic. And then we can start. If you, if you remember the old film from Sydney, kind of had colonnades running down it, and they took those out of the way when cars came in because cars crashed into them so <laughs> horses don't crash into them but cars did so there's loads of lovely comments going on there i think that's interesting um i think the this question about homeless which is where you started mary i think uh again building on what cynthia says i mean it's just this is why we're um the projects i'm doing now are all about trying to build this ongoing participative ad you know completely engaged mode so to get away from planning as this kind of fire and forget process, urban design is something you do a drawing for and it just gets built and you never really see that. But to actually get people out on the ground in the streets and municipal workers, all kinds of people, community groups, private sector companies, in those photos I showed at the workshops, we may have big companies like Volvo and Ericsson, as well as small startups, as well as NGOs and others, all in the same room at the same time. And then we get them out on the streets and we walk around. But then to build in a culture of doing that repeatedly, you know, to make sure that a municipal worker should be spending more time in the street than in their office. I mean, that's really, really where we're trying to get to. That begins to solve that problem. I think we, at least it begins to approach that problem, put it that way, in a more, in the way that Zara described in terms of solidarity. This is our shared opportunity or problem. It's not like your problem or mine. So I think, yeah, finally, I'd just say about this kind of, um, 
The question about homelessness is interesting because, I mean, again, it's sort of one of those where I want to go to the root cause and say there's just it's pointless having homeless people anyway. The society is already not working if you have that problem, and you can't really solve that from the street end of stuff, if you know what I mean. Like Finland figured out a long time ago, it's just easier to give homeless people a house, yeah. and it's actually cheaper to do that. The societal cost is cheaper it's just by giving someone a house because it prevents them at some point later on if they don't get a house as you know they end up a, a problem with one end of the system that someone has to pick up so the overall total cost is less to solve homelessness by giving people a home mm -hmm. it's uh, anyway leaving that aside <laughs> so, yeah um, no, I, I know it's kind of a very european thing to say so apologies but i think that, that is that is kind of where we get to the end, I think, of just this, what I really love about the comments from Cynthia and Zara is they're just conjuring this kind of spirit of the way you approach something like the street, which is what I was trying to get across. It's like, it's a shared space. It's full of opportunities, whether that's for putting chickens out there and growing raspberries, or it's for street parties and cafes or whatever. And that's up to the street to decide. And it's the, the residents and the users of the street, they can figure it out at that level. Our job is to just, give them the kit, give them the space, give them the support, give them the ongoing engagement and the, and the, the care and repair required to do that. But I have every confidence in people's capability to handle something like the street. Well, folks, on that very uh, uh, def directive note, go out and be your own street. Uh, <laughs> go make your city, folks. Uh, this is what City Talk's all about, and we're very appreciative to have this lecture and to have us start off the fall season with Dan Hill, joined by Cynthia and Zara. So thanks very much, Dan. We're, we're, we're not going to lose your number. Uh, you, uh, you <laughs> no, happy to stay in touch, and we can, you know, we can work as cold weather countries. We need to stick together and figure out this stuff, so I'm happy sure, to work. We need to. Well, and you know, every day is a new day under COVID. That's the thing. I mean, it's a... I lived in New Orleans for years and people would lament the weather. They'd say, you don't like the weather. We'd say, just wait 15 minutes. Well, I feel like that's what we're dealing with the COVID is that basically everything changes all the time as we know. And that's what the Canadian Urban Institute's about is trying to track this and, and empower people and inform people in terms of how they can themselves get engaged in building the cities that we need and want as we, as we continue to evolve. So um, this is a big day, as I said, for CUI, 30 years of uh, this kind of engagement and looking to the next year and uh, both Zara and Cynthia are on our board and uh, they are going to spend a couple of hours with me later this afternoon for our annual general meeting so I look forward to seeing you two ladies later. Dan I hope you get some supper uh, after this and uh, we're going to look forward to posting your uh, remarks and the chat and we will take whatever Cole's notes you send us around uh, uh, footnotes we'll post those too. Just remember folks the conversation continues this is just the beginning so hashtag city talk uh, take the transcript and circulate it with your friends and colleagues. Let's watch all these things again. Um, for City Talk this fall, I know that you got kind of used to seeing us two or three times a week uh, in the spring, and we're going to uh, do a little experimenting because it, we're open to experimentation, uh, and we're going to do some deeper dives as we did today. So we were 90 minutes live today. Um, in uh, On September 21st, we are co-hosting with a group out of uh, Halifax, The Art of City Building, um, uh, where Cynthia resides, and their theme is on underwater. That'll be a full day watch your email you'll get an invitation to that and there'll be a special city talk there uh, with mayors across uh, North America who are on uh, who are literally underwater coastal mayors uh, talking about the challenges their cities are facing and I'm also going to have a little fireside chat with Eric Kleinenberg about the important role of libraries as he calls them palaces for the people so that's in September then COVID 200 comes that next week September 28 a whole week on what are the implications as we hit the 200 day mark and then early in October we're going to start to release all our work on bring back Main Street, bring back your street, bring back, bring forward the street, whatever the streets are going to look like and let's hope we don't have snow quite yet but we might. So Dan, thanks again, Zara, Cynthia, thanks everyone, great to see you. We'll Pleasure. Be back soon. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye.